Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm here with Dr. Thomas uh, Nikolai and welcome to the seventh in a series of AGIF sustainability webinars. In the coming months, every week on Thursdays, we'll continue to deliver webinars on turf and club management with industry leaders to supply career building information to professionals in Asia. The Asian Golf Industry Federation is a non-for-profit membership federation comprising of suppliers and facilities in the turf club and sports industry. And the Federation focuses on building sustainable practices, both in environmental and economic aspects throughout the Asia Pacific region. We believe that key in the development of sustainable industry is the education and empowerment of professionals industry and hence these webinars like we're running today. Uh, we have developed the AGIF certificate in greenskeeping, which is supported by the RNA and five AGIF member organizations. CIG focuses on developing the skill set of green keepers and turf professionals throughout Asia. We also focus on club management education and are a partner of the Club Management Association of America. We have rolled out education in Asia for the pathway to the certified club manager degree. The CCM is considered the gold standard in club management industry globally and managers in Asia can now achieve the necessary education here in Asia as a result of this partnership with the CMAA. It is vital to have strong partners in implementing education throughout Asia, and our education is recognized for credits from the PGA of America, the PGA of GB in Ireland, the PGA of Australia, the PGA of Japan, <clears throat> the Club Management Association of America, and the GCSAA. Due to the travel restrictions with COVID-19 pandemic, webinars are the only way we can continue to deliver education at the moment. Uh, but we'll resume events education when travel restrictions ease and we'll keep you posted as this develops. Over the last few months, we spent a lot of time improving our digital offering and membership benefits. For more information, please log on to www.agif.asia as well as our LinkedIn and Facebook company pages. Please also sign up for our weekly newsletter to join the 10,000 industry contacts in receiving weekly industry update. Lastly, the AGIF is a not-for-profit federation and now more than ever, we rely upon membership dues to operate. So if we, you like what we do and or you think that your facility or company will benefit from communicating with the industry, please note that our membership benefits are substantial and can be seen on our website under AGI of membership benefits. Please take a look. And if you are already an AGI member, thank you so much. Your ongoing support is greatly appreciated. We also like to thank the sponsor for today's webinar. Without their support, we would not be able to run these events. They are the Toro Company. Syngenta and True Surface. They are all founding members of the AGIF and strong supporters of industry education. On to some housekeeping issues. Uh, Dr. Tom will present on the topic for roughly 60 minutes and we'll have 30 minutes after that for Q&A. The chat buttons are on throughout, so please feel free to ask questions and then voice we can voice them to Dr. Tom during the Q&A session. There are also a few survey questions for you to answer as well on the poll section. Now on to the main event and to introduce our speaker, Thomas A. Nikolai, PhD, discovered that lightweight rolling decreases dollar spots and other turf grass pests, and he initiated mowing rolling frequency research that maintains consistent greed speeds, reduces turf grass stress, and leads to economic saving. Tom also discovered that mulching deciduous leaves into turf grass canopies result in fewer broadleaf weeds and initiated alternative spike research, which paved the way for the demise of the metal spike. He is the author of the book, The Superintendent's Guide to Putting Green Speed, and is world renowned as the doctor of green speed due to the numerous studies he has performed that investigate putting greens cultural and mechanical practices. He has given hundreds of presentations on four continents, 30 countries, seven Canadian provinces, and 36 states. In 2010, he initiated a study to investigate social, economic, and environmental impact of turf grass on an urban society by mowing and fertilizing around abandoned homes, lots, and parks in Flint, Michigan. In 2003 and in 2017, Dr. Nikolai was voted the outstanding faculty member at Michigan State University, and he pens a bi-monthly bi column called Up to Speed for the GCM Magazine, for which he was awarded the TOCA Merit Award for series of columns. Tom is also well known as being the creator and host of the Turfgrass Talk Show. Dr. Thomas Nikolai, welcome. Wow, that was a lot, Eric. <laughs> oh, it's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Um, um, 
Do I do I go to screen now? Yeah, yeah, go to share and then uh, you're off. So and do you want me to talk for one hour or do you want me to talk for like an hour and 20? Uh, I think hour is a good time, you know, and then we have some time for, for question and answer and therefore we have 90 minutes sort of set within our, our audience's time. That okay, I'll see how fast I can go. Earlier. <laughs> and, uh, and if any time anybody has a question, uh, I know this isn't the easiest format to do it, but I'm. If I if there was another country that allowed me to go to it and I could give a talk, I would. I really like the interaction. But uh, so anytime yeah. you have a question, just let me know. And uh, let's see. I'm going here, I think, and then like that. Is that right? Perfect. Okay. Beautiful. Okay, I'm starting off here. Uh, for those of you that don't recognize this, this is the state of Michigan, which is an Indian word, which literally means big mitten. Um, around the state of Michigan are five great lakes, really four of them. Uh, but in those five great lakes are 20% of the world's fresh water that's on the surface of the planet. Um, so, environmental stewardship in our industry uh, it literally came here first. A lot of people would have thought probably Florida, uh, but that's salt water. Uh, we have all this fresh water and it, it became a really big thing. This little star is about where I live. And I am probably just about, I got a map of the world up over there. I got to be just about as far away from you as I could be and still on this planet. And so it's like, what's this guy going to tell me? How's he going to help me in, in Asia? Uh, this is my campus, a part of it. Um, it's fall. This is kind of what it looks like right now. It's beautiful. Um, and I'm the kind of person that when I go canoeing, this is what it looks like. So, so I work with cool season grasses and I'm in a different world and Hopefully we can bridge the gap here a little bit, but I do know some people that live on that side of the planet. Um, this is Andy Johnson and he and I were classmates and went through the Michigan State University two-year program together. And he is, I think many of you may, some of you at least know this, is the, uh, uh, works at uh, uh, Sentosa in Singapore, right? Do you know him, Eric? Yes, I do. Uh, Andy's a, a big, strong supporter. He's actually on our board for many years. So we all know Andy. He's a legend. Yeah, I would have thought so. Yeah. And I also, uh, Andy and I one day were sitting in a class and it was called Turfgrass Seminar. And uh, one of the individuals that came and taught us about how to prepare and how to be a professional in the turfgrass industry, industry was named Bruce Williams. Um, so we got some Michigan Staters, and I, I, I know I've been to, I've been fortunate enough that that some some uh, Jacobson's taken me over to, to to that side of the planet a couple times, as well as it was Andy's they even had me over. So let's see if I got anything for you. Um, I used to be a golf course superintendent. I worked ten years in the industry, working on golf courses, and one of the things that that, and before that, I built homes. And before that, and, and I also worked in factories. And when you're walking away from a factory job, um, or you're walking away from building a home, there's an end product you can see. And, and it, it has a lot of weight to it. You know, you got it, you're done. It's, it's awesome. Uh, when I was working on a golf course, the, the, and became a superintendent, the thing that really was hard for me was what's my worth? How, what did I do? How did, how did I run this? And I'll, I'll get more to that, but the ABCs of golf course maintenance is all of us that have gone to college or we've gone to school, that's what the A is. What we've gone for is agronomics. We're learning how to take care of the plant while it's under stress. Now, that's the number one thing we teach at Michigan State in our program. We do touch upon a little bit of what the B stands for. 
and the B stands for budgets. We got, we're all within a budget. Um, doesn't matter who we are. And certainly our golf course operation has to be within a budget. Then that brings us down to C. And what's C? Uh, we got a budgeting class when I was at Michigan State and it was so-so. I hope it's better now. Uh, but C is customer satisfaction. Um, I remember being given a talk somewhere uh, and Bruce Williams was in the crowd. And I said, you know, when I worked on golf courses, sometimes I think to myself, you know, if it weren't for the golfers, this would be the best job in the world. <laughs> and Bruce, always being the mentor, was the next speaker after me and said, if you think you wish the golfers weren't there, you should get out of the, get out of the profession. And he was absolutely right. Um, <laughs> in any event, uh, this is like the biggie. And, and, and I always tried to figure out how to provide satisfaction. So let's kind of start there. I'm called the Dr. Greenspeed. Uh, I didn't give myself the name. Um, and and this, is, this is an old guy. Uh, I think this is from 2002, maybe 2004. But it's a survey done by the Golf Course Superintendents Association. Okay. What do golfers think is the most important thing on the course? And speed of greens came up number one. I mean, and literally, you can still find magazines. This is what they want to know. Uh, this is uh, an old Christmas issue of a golf course magazine. Uh, it says up here, why wait? 63 things the golfer wants now. Awesome. Let's open it up and see. Well, here's the page. We open it up and just start seeing this list of 63 things people want for what golfers want. I know you're looking at what every golfer must want right now. It's right sitting there in the middle. Uh, what is it? Uh, oh, it's a stip meter. It's right there. This is, be, this is a magazine, by the way, in case you're not aware, for golfers, not for golf course superintendents, but for golfers. And what's it say? Don't trust the superintendent. Get your own stip meter and see how fast those greens are really rolling. This kind of becomes a problem, um, a big problem. So when I do my ABCs, ergonomics, budget, and customer satisfaction, big part of that customer satisfaction to me is speed of greens. Why do I say that? Because that's what they're telling me. That's what they want to know. And they still want them smooth, and they still want them fast, and they still want them firm. But this has always been the problem. Who's your source of information? Who are you going to ask? You're going to go to the Ouija board, okay? You're going to who to ask? And for the longest time, getting the correct information about green speed was extremely, extremely difficult. The three most common answers a golf course superintendent, director of a course, gets when requesting help or information about green speed are one out of three. Number one, speed kills, speed kills. Just don't even go there. It's not a good idea. Now the problem is it's a lie or it's ignorance. Speed doesn't kill. Speed does not kill greens. It does not, it's just not true, okay? The only thing they should have been saying was, you know, I don't know how to get your greens there, but it doesn't kill. Number two, people would hire consultants. They'd have them come in and the golf course superintendent might be saying to the people, you know, or to the consultant, you know, these members really want me to push these greens. And, uh, you know, it's kind of putting a lot of stress on them. I'd, I'd, I'd like it if you'd get them to calm down and and a consultant might go in and say to the members, you've got to lower your expectations. Uh, you know, Tom here can't give you what you want. Uh, you're just going to have to lower your expectations. I want you to think about that for a moment. 
there's nothing positive. Think of one time in your life ever, ever. And please email me if you ever get the answer. That when someone wanted you and made you lower your expectations and you looked back and went, God, I'm so much happier about that. <laughs> it's a really bad business model. Both of these are a bad business model for maintaining uh, a golf course uh, for many years at the same place. Okay, they're all anti. And then number three is lie. And I wrote that in my book. And and I got a call, I got a phone call from the superintendent, and he was livid at me that I wrote that. And I said, "Yeah, but it's true." And he's like, "He's like, no." And I saved lots of articles, and here's one right here. Um, <laughs> this is certainly suggesting that we lie about the speed of the green. When you read what's underneath there, with a little ingenuity, high stint meter readings can be achieved without being as detrimental to the turf. Again, that also that suggests that speed kills. I don't think that's true. Speed does not kill. Ignorance kills, not going there the right way, not getting what you want. Um, and you can give the members what they want. The hardest part might be teaching them what they want, but we can get it, okay? Little history, I'm a big history buff. Uh, uh, the stip meter was actually invented by Eddie Stimson. He wrote an article in 1937 uh, where he, the name of it is Introducing the Stimp. He named it after himself. Uh, in the article itself, he spells stimp meter, I think, three different ways to add to the confusion of the instrument right off the bat. Um, he was the only person that owned a stimp meter, but I think it's really neat. Um, he invented it because it occurred to them that they were talking about green speed, but nobody knew what it was. So how, it, famous saying, you cannot manage what you cannot measure. And there is no way to measure it. So he invented it. Um, there you go. In his article, he reports six green speed measurements he took in 1937. And the average green speed in 1937 was 27 inches. Or for those of you that are in metric, I'm sorry. Um, but I know green speed is usually talked about in feet and that's a little over two feet. That would be hard to even make happen. <laughs> in 1974, he wrote a second article. He only wrote two that I know of there could find. And this is the exact same stint meter that he has in the first one because it's the only stint meter on the planet. He invented it, no one else has one. And in 1974, he writes a second article. Again, the first one is 1937. He took green speed measurements at the US Open in 1963, where the green speed was 32 inches. That's under three feet, okay? Report, you add them all up. And from 1946 to 1973, again, the average green speed was 27 inches or just a little over two feet. Now, you might be thinking, what the heck? How could it only be 27 inches? But let's start with the first thing, because this is cool. In 1937, he makes these measurements and, and it's the same average going all the way up to 1973, pretty much. And the reason that was, the reason that that's believable is almost nothing changed in the way we managed golf courses during that entire time frame. And everything begins to change, ironically, in the beginning of the 70s with better mowers. That begins it, okay? When that happens, the USGA decide to take this stint meter. They made it longer. They, they made it a V-shaped groove instead of a, uh, instead of a U-shaped groove, which the original one was. And they went out 
and they tested, they sent it, and they, they took green speed measurements at 1,500 courses in 36 states of the United States. And they took those and the average green speed in the United States at that time was six feet, six inches. And that's what the same stint meter we use today. They came up with this thing. They came up with an instruction booklet that said we we're gonna have fast greens, medium greens and slow greens. Obviously you would take the national average, 1978, you'd take the national average and call that medium and fast being eight foot six, okay? Most courses today are eight foot six without even trying, <laughs> I would think. Um, and it's really because of what's happened with the maintenance. This, this, this is written by the USGA uh, and the USGA spent 74, 75, 76, 77 writing articles about the stint meter is coming, the stint meter is coming, the stint meter is coming. They're really excited. And then it comes out and now everyone hates it and it's creating arguments. And this article says the green section stint meter, most think it friends, some think it enemy. But I really love what he says here. Uh, and we're gonna blow up this paragraph right here. Okay, again, this is July, 1982. The stint meter came out in 78. So this is four years later. That's it. People are yelling, these are other articles. People are getting mad, but we're just gonna go and look at this little paragraph here and blow it up. The author writes to it, and this is why you shouldn't want fast green speeds. This is what they're saying. To achieve fast greens on a daily basis requires more maintenance. Fast greens must be mowed more frequently. They must be verticut more frequently. They must be top dressed more frequently. Fertilization must be on a light frequent basis. Watering must be done more carefully. Lower mowing heights need to be achieved for fast green speeds. A reduced rooting depth can happen. Okay, It's saying all these things and the result was with all this push and all the, all the saying the speed kills, this is where the innovative superintendent went. Why? Customer satisfaction. The recognition that, wow, we now have the materials, we can now measure it and we can now get there, okay? And people win. Uh, this is from a, a golfer magazine uh, showing that this is like when greens are getting fast for the first time ever. And, and it's like, wow. I went around and took green speed measurements on pool tables um, with a cue ball, because you can't do it with a golf course, and found that pool tables stem 15 to 16 feet. So the question is, is that fast? And the answer is, who knows? It's a pool table. <laughs> but what if that pool table had undulations in it? <laughs> that ball's never gonna stop rolling, okay? So what is too fast? People talk about too fast. There's articles I could go, I could show you so many articles. People talk about things being too fast. What is it? My favorite definition was made by Al Ratko, who's the person responsible for the stint meter, when he simply wrote, a hole should be placed in such a position that no matter where the golfer is putting from, it should be possible to stop the ball within approximately two feet of the hole. So that takes two things into consideration, speed and undulations for that ball to be able to stop. And to me, that's still good today. And if it can't do that, it's probably too fast. We did green speed perception studies at Michigan State University. Uh, I've done them quite a few places. These are two side-by-side -side plots. I've got these two side-by-side -side plots and we're just simply asking people, which one's faster, this one or this one? And then we have other ones here and here and here and here. And they're taking about a 20 foot putt on each and they just tell one of us scientists with the clipboard, which one's faster. Let's look at the data. I've got 
greens that are this the these the blue lines are a half a foot difference in speed from side by side plots. The yellow lines are a half a foot are one foot difference, a one foot difference in green speed from side by side plots, right next to each other, not separated by, you know, four hundred yards in a beer cart grow, right next to each other. What do we got? When green speeds are half a foot difference, a half, six inches, a half a foot difference, 50% of the golfers could tell the difference, which means no one could tell the difference because that's the statistic you get when you're guessing. You only had two choices. <laughs> that's nothing. When we got to a foot difference in green speed and the green speed was 710 to 810, over 80% of the people could tell. As we increased our speed on side-by-side -side plots to 8.6 to 9.6, less than 70 could tell. What that tells us is if we built, if, we, if we're trying to make all our greens more consistent from green to green to green, the easiest way to do it is to speed them up. <laughs> because the faster we make the greens, the larger uniformity becomes. Now, I want you to remember this. Can golfers tell the difference of six inches in green speed? The answer is no. But we're gonna pretend they can. We know they can't tell five inches or four inches, but we will pretend six and we'll get around to why in a moment. This is Mike Morris. He's golf course superintendent at Crystal Downs Country Club. Um, he called me one day and asked me this question. Is it possible to maintain a consistent green speed for an entire playing season? And because he called me, and if I would have said to him, oh, Mike, Mike, you got to, speed kills. You got to get your members to lower their expectations. If I would have said that to him, I wouldn't be talking to you today because this was the beginning of a path that we went down together. Um. This is Crystal Downs Country Club. Uh, as you can see, it looks nothing like Asia. <laughs> but you have, you both have members that kind of want perfection as much as possible day to day. And that's what this is really about. It's an old club established in 1927. Uh, Alistair McKenzie and Perry Maxwell, six month season, 12,000 rounds. You probably get that in three months. <laughs> It's, it's a POA bent greens that average 4,100 square feet. So they're small, okay? I'm sorry, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't change that. Square feet, that's really small, okay? Um, Mike's sitting in a meeting one day, everyone's complaining about green speed, everyone's upset. He goes into the meeting and the greens, the greens chairman says, hey Mike, what's our green speeds day to day? Mike said, uh, I don't know. Wow. Everyone's complaining about green speeds. He's the superintendent and he doesn't know. That didn't go over all. And then they asked him a harder question. What's the best speed for our golf course? And that's when Mike picked up the phone and called me. And we went on this journey together and I said to him, well, if we want to answer what's the best speed for the golf course, we have to, we have to take a survey of the members of your golf course. And he went to his greens committee and they, and then he called me up and told them that. And he called me up and he said, uh, the greens committee said, no, we're not going to ask the golfers what they want. I want you to think about how insane that is. These people spend so much money for clubs, for gloves, for membership, but they just didn't want to open up this can of worms to ask them how they wanted their green speeds to be. I mean, it's, it's literally insane to think that that's how they were thinking. I mean, it's, it's insane. Any of it, um, I told them, well, if we can't survey the golfers, then what, what green speed do you want? 
I mean, if it's a bad one, you're going to piss everyone off. Excuse my language. <laughs> so step one, we start taking data. We start collecting green speed measurements every day from the same spot. Okay. Back when we started doing this, this was when Augusta, uh, I think Augusta does it a lot different now. This is where they hold the masters. They take a soil probe, they put orange sand in there, and that's where you start from, and that's where you go back to. Because these are your records for your golf course, and they're meaningless anywhere else except on your course. They took green speed measurements every morning at 7 and every afternoon at 2.30, and if you take, do that, you run into golfers. And if you run into golfers when you're taking green speed members, they love you because you're educating them. And if you're educating the golfer, about something they care about and they see you doing it and they take it. Now this guy can go back into the clubhouse and if the pro says, oh, the greens are slow today, they're only a nine, he can go, oh no, no. I was out there with the superintendent today. I helped them measure them. They're an 11. I mean, it's being visible in a way that they know you're trying to provide them joy. Then we took the survey and this is the survey. I call it the Morris method because Mike Morris did it at his golf course first. I've done this at well over 100 courses. I don't even know how many now. Here's the important thing. It's a five question, one question. After members get done playing golf, they walk into the clubhouse, they're given a card, on the card is a date. On the date, it just says this. Today's green speed was too slow, Slow, okay, okay, fast, okay, or too fast. Or in other words, five options. Don't go with, if you do this, don't go with slow, okay, fast. You really want all five options, okay? Um, we take it and graph it. When we graph it, notice these are half foot increments. Why? Because if it's within a half foot, golfers can't tell the difference. So we don't have to measure every inch or for you, millimeter. If we go across this and we could see it, Crystal Downs Country Club, this is, these bars are too fast, slow, okay, okay, fast, okay, too fast. And notice when we got over 11 feet on Mike's course, 25% of the people thought it was too fast. So let's look at this nine and a half to 10 and a half range. And when we do that, this is what we find. Green speed with nine and a half and ten and a half at Mike's course, we see over 80% of the golfers like that range. So we're not shooting for a speed, we're shooting for a one-foot range. Why do they like this so much? It's it, it's their customer satisfaction. If we add in the other 12.7% that say it's slow and okay, we're up to 94 five, 96% customer satisfaction. We did this survey, I think in 2002. It's 2020 right now. They've never changed this. It's still nine and a half to 10 and a half. The beauty of doing this is now we can evaluate all our maintenance practices back to that range. Even if you never survey your golfers, even if you never try and hone it in, the key is to know what you want that green speed to be. Because if you can do that, you can save money and you can make the turf healthier. Because now you're not just guessing, you're not being ignorant on trying to make things fast. You're locking it in. These are all the different kinds of things we do on, on golf courses. So what I got about 25 minutes. Is that right, Eric? I can't hear you. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes. That's fine. Okay. Good. Thank okay. you. Um, think about all these things we do to our golf course screen. <laughs> it's, I mean, it, it, it's absolutely amazing. And, 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 and you're, you're great professionals and it takes so much work to try and make these things beautiful. But what effect does all these things have on, on, on customer satisfaction? Okay, Let's just look at mowing for a little bit. And for me, when I look at something, I like to look all the way back. 
Um, so when was golf invented? And it's pertinent to this discussion um, because, well, let's see. The old course at St. Andrews dates before 1574. Now, that's a long time ago. And there's also pictures from the Ming Dynasty that uh, are in China that show essentially women playing a game that, that translates to, I think it translates to hit ball. And it certainly looks like they're putting on a surface to me. Um, so this type of activity is very old. But then comes the question, we're playing golf since 1574 or 1924 or whatever date you want to grab. How do we mow the grass? And generally what people like to say is sheep. And this is, this is Pebble Beach, actually. And uh, these are sheep. Uh, but that's not how we mowed the greens. Uh-uh. If you really do your research and you really look and you really read, which I did, uh, this is my favorite quote. There are greens in which the rabbits are the chief and almost only green keepers. The rabbits crop the grass short and produce an emerald quality of springy turf. I do not suppose any other greens are kept up to an equal degree of excellence with so little expense and wages of greens keepers as these and all because the rabbits do such so much of the work without payment. They'd actually put pins around the greens and put the rabbits in and they would chew on it in the evenings and then they'd pick them up, put them back in their cages, remove the pins, remove the rabbit poop. And that was their best playing surfaces they could get. This is all, this is 1906, okay? I work at Michigan State University and Michigan State University is the first land grant institution in the United States. And what that means is it was the first agricultural college in the United States of America. Teaching the masses, teaching the, the common people, the farmer, uh, giving them a university education for farming, as opposed to everything being like more of the, the law schools type of thing. Every single agricultural class, every crop that we grow, we can grow with the concept of diminishing returns. Every single one of them, okay? Oh, that slide was out of place, but that's okay. The first lawnmower was invented in 1830. When was golf invented? A centuries earlier. And this is a lawnmower, by the way, it's not a green mower. The next lawnmower, we finally got gasoline power mowers in 1902. Um, the oldest, if doing research and looking in the library, the oldest mowing height I can find mowing height was from 1922 and it was 9.5 millimeters okay in 1922 by 1930 we have experiments with turf grasses and what happened in the early 20s is for the first time ever we got good lawn mowers so this is an extension bulletin from march of 1930 And from that, we can see that they're saying we should be able to cut down to 3 sixteenths of an inch, or for you, 4.7 millimeters. I've got to admit, I'm surprised that we could cut that low that far back. Here's a survey from the United States Golf Association in 1947, looking at asking how, what's your, they asked uh, golf courses and. 27 states reported what their mowing heights were. Um, and the lowest mowing height was 4.7 millimeters back in 1947, which by the way, was still about the lowest we could go in the year 1972. That's why Stimson's green speed measurements didn't change that much. So we all know that lower mowing heights, lead, heights and less nitrogen lead to increased green speed. The problem is that's not necessarily true. There's a point of diminishing returns in all of this, okay? So let's talk what the A is about, agronomics. 
as I said, I went to Michigan State University and every crop, every single crop can be grown by diminishing returns. And let's just make it simple. If I'm growing on a farm field year after year after year, and I know I put down five pounds of nitrogen, I know I'm gonna get 10 bushels of corn. If I put down, one year I decide to put in six pounds of nitrogen instead of five, and now I get 15 bushels of corn. And I say to myself, oh my gosh, I should have always been putting down six pounds of nitrogen. One day you say to yourself, one year you say to yourself, I'm gonna put down seven pounds of nitrogen and see if I can get five more bushels of corn, but you do and you get one more bushel of corn. And you realize by putting down that extra pound of nitrogen, and I think about how much time it took me to put the fertilizer on the field and how much fuel it took me to do it and how much it cost, I actually lost money. That's hitting the point of diminishing returns. There's no way we can do that in golf. There's no way we can do that in turf grass. And that always drove me insane. And we couldn't do it because we have the only crop in the entire world that we don't want more yield. We don't want, so that's meaningless. But then working with Mike and playing with this green speed stuff, it occurred to me, wait a minute. Yes, we can. We can do diminishing returns with green speed. Research says if I go from 4.7 to 3.9 millimeter height of cut, I pick up a foot of green speed. Can golfers tell that? Yes, they can. It's worth you to do for customer satisfaction. Research says that if I drop another 0.8 and go from 3.9 to 3.1 millimeters, I pick up eight inches of green speed. Can golfers tell that? Yes, they can. Let's do it. Research says if I go from 3.1 to 2.4 millimeters, I pick up four inches of green speed. Can golfers tell that? No. Why go there? It's a waste. What all we've done with this is create stress for the plant and the golfers can't even tell. Or we could drop it another 0.8 millimeters and go all the way down to 1.6. And if you still have grass, you only pick up two more inches, okay? The point is now this, and I'll show you in a little bit, isn't quite that accurate anymore. Why? Oh, because in the last 10 years, mowers have gotten even better, okay? This was, this was a solid line until the last couple of years. One of the reasons you don't want to mow lower than you need to is because this, this is three plots that were trafficked with actual people trafficking them. They're three different mowing heights. Which one of these do you think, A, B, or C, stood up to traffic the best? I actually hired someone to go out there for a month and walk on these plots all the same, okay? Well, shouldn't it be a surprise. This one looks like it's putting up with the traffic the most. Oh, and it's the highest cutting height. Awesome. When you get a green speed you're going for, um, and this is a superintendent wrote me, they decided that they wanted their greens to be in nine and a half to 10 and a half. And that's what they're gonna shoot for every day. When he did that, he realized Oh my gosh, now everyone's happy, except when the greens are too fast, strange enough. And now you can make decisions like raising your mowing height and doing other things to get the speed. It's using intelligence. Uh, this is Dan. Dan's assistant. Dan is the mechanic at Crystal Downs Country Club. And when they started taking daily green speed measurements, Dan called up and told Don, every day you take those green speed measurements, I want you to call me first on the walkie talkie and tell me. And what he did, he figured out that when his bed knife got too thin, he actually lost speed, not increased speed, but lost it. And it makes sense. 
for any of us that shave. You shave your face and you got a nice smooth cut when you get a brand new razor. You let it get dull, you're not getting a good cut anymore. And then for his turf grass, it meant it slowed down the speed. What that also means is, think economically, it means he's not wasting his bed knife. He's not, you, he, know, he knows when to get rid of it. Why? You cannot measure what you cannot measure, and he learned how to measure it. Did some studies with some mowers here. Uh, this, this is uh, to show you how much things have changed. Each one of these plots was mown with a different mower, okay? Um, I've got mowing heights of 0 0.080, 0 0.110, and 0 0.140, and darn, I'm sorry to put this in metric. Um, this, these are really tight mowing heights, okay? And, and let's see, generally the 0.80 is the fastest green speed by, ooh, quite a bit, okay? So we actually have machines from all the companies that can get us down that low now. What I do wanna show you this though, this is really cool. When we talk about, when people talk about best management practices, one of the things, or, or integrated pest manage, which, whichever acronym they wanna put on it, uh, one of the things that always comes to be is, they always say, don't mow too low, don't mow too low. Almost every book says, if you mow too low, you're gonna to get too much disease. Well, let's look at this. This is the lowest mowing height, and the lowest mowing height gets the most moss. Now, that makes sense to me, okay? And the higher the mowing height, the less moss. Good. This is dollar spot. Dollar spot is a very big disease here. Let's see. The highest mowing height gets the most disease. What? This is what we spend more money on than any other disease, but the lowest mowing height actually has less of it. So it's basically knowing your past when you're gonna kind of choose a mowing height as well. Uh, also lower, we have more clipping height, more clipping weights, more biomass production at the lower height of cut. And it, it kind of makes sense because the grass is trying so hard to grow so it can go through photosynthesis. We also have the one of the negatives of lower heights of cut is we pick up more sand from our top dressing material. We saw that a lot, most of the time. And that makes sense, that's intuitive. So we should want to know how to incorporate our sand as best as possible so we're not picking it up because that's a waste of money. Um, years ago, I did these studies myself and had a couple superintendents because literally we're sitting in a bar back in the late 90s See, talking about if there's a difference in green speed between a triplex and a walk line. So we all did some studies and this is from Bend Country Club and just showing us that the walk behind was a half a foot faster in green speed throughout the course of the trial. We did it at another golf course on Bermuda grass, which a lot of you, this is a warm season grass. And same thing, the walk behind, in this case, the walk behind uh, ended up a foot faster, a one foot faster in green speed over the course of the study. And that's because walk behinds, and I've told people this for years, just give you that better cut. It's just more machined in and honed in. And, and, and if you, you, know, you read my book, I'd show you the same data in it and just show you the, the nicest things about walk behinds that you can really get the green speed. That's changing. Um, there's some new stuff out now. I've been fortunate to do some research over the years with, with Jacobson, with John Deere, with Toro. I spent four years with uh, Toro honing in their newest triplex and doing, well, two things that are negative about a triplex. Um, um, the, the, the ring around the collar, um, and the other thing is you couldn't really get the speed and get it low enough. Um, I can't show you the data from this study yet, but I can promise you this, uh, this mower right here can get the same speed as, a, as this walk behind. 
and this is terribly close and we're not really seeing the the uh um it's easy to see which ones to walk behind isn't it <laughs> you still get the striping okay um but the speed is the speed is really uh what's happening with the new triplexes are pretty amazing in america that's kind of a big thing because we have less labor and i don't know how that is in asia but but the labor shortage is kind of coming along, um, you know, and then we know with the triplexes, I worked, uh, I think it was uh, Jacobson was the first one I ever worked with, with the uh, uh, frequency of clip and you could change that and really take away the, the ring on the collar on that one as well. Um, so this is just, it, these, these triplexes are really coming along. So let's close by talking about rolling. A little bit okay and i have a thing i call the top 10 reasons to roll for golf greens um we don't have time to do all of them um i'm going to go straight to the important ones that i think could be just as important for you in asia as they are for me in michigan okay uh, number eight of the top 10 reasons to roll golf greens is Believe it or not, it kills weeds. Um, um, in 1998, when I was doing research, I see this little broadleaf weed growing here. And I look at my data and where I roll, I have less broadleaf weeds, okay? Where I roll, I have less moss. I mean, a lot less moss. If you look at this, this is rolled versus not rolled, okay? Rolling is killing the moss. I get a email from some guy 12, 13, 14 years later asking me if anyone's looking at moss control and rolling. And I write him back and I wrote in my book that came out before this. I think that you have less weeds and less moss because the rolling is giving me better density. He writes back to me and tells me I'm an idiot. He says, you're no way. That's not what it is. And he sends me this picture. And I love this picture. This is moss growing in a putting surface. And you see there's not moss here. Oops. And there's not moss here because that's where the tires of the triplex go all the time. Then he sends me this picture. I know a lot of places in Asia look probably just like this, where you might have moss with the tire tracks on it. Um, oh, I think it's moist there, a lot of places. And I see this all the time. And the point is, the moss can't put up with the traffic. Then I think to myself about the weeds. Look at this, here's weeds in the middle. Okay, grass dies here, but over here, there, we still have grass. Of course, duh. Sorry, broke my glasses. The reason we play every single sport, soccer, baseball, football. Um, um, what's the one with the famous one over there? Um, cricket, okay. Everything's played on grass because grass is the most Traffic tolerant plant in the world. What's a roller provide? Traffic. What can survive at the most? Grass. Awesome. What a great coincidence. Did some studies looking at some weeds. Uh, you just, I just want to show you. This is what the day we started the study. By the time the study's over, notice the control where we don't roll has the most weeds. Okay. Let's look at. Quack grass, that's another plant. Rolling absolutely killed that weed. Gone, just gone, okay? Awesome. Um, we looked at this in a trial, rolling on, and this is rolling on tall grass, so we can really see what it can do, okay? Um, this, is, this is quality, what the grass looks like, and the higher the number, the grass looks the best. Notice, we're going through June to August. We're rolling once a day, twice a day, and three times a week. And how the fact is where we're not rolling has the worst quality. 
This is where we sprayed a crabgrass study. And our best ones are the ones we roll. Now let's look at the amount of crabgrass in a plot. Well, when we apply the when we apply the chemical treatment, we're getting like no crabgrass, right? 1%, 1%. We got to give it a number. But look at this, the rolling does a great job too. But finally, finally, where we're, we put the chemical, what happened? The chemical wore out. Now, if we combine the chemical with the rolling, now we're really doing something long-term for the plant. Rolling also decreases localized dry spot. The first time I ever took this picture or saw this, I never thought I'd see it again. As you can see, this is rolled. This is, you know, this is 1995. This is 2000. Every year I saw this over and over and over again. What happens also when I roll? Ready? Drum roll. I get more roots. Whoa. Got so many people really care about roots. And rolling is kind of and that makes sense that you would have less localized dry spot if you have more roots. And since I have more roots, I mean, everyone seems to want those. So I have more roots than not rolled in my top dressing layer. And my top dressing layer was, oh gosh, just about two inches. So, um, and then beneath that, no differences. I was talking about the fact that if we mow tighter, we have a chance to pick up more sand after a top dressing. And uh, I thought to myself, you know what? I'm going to try and use this vibratory roller and play with it. Uh, this is the type of sand we put down, probably more than most of you put down now. I'm going to guess, okay? I didn't have the best equipment to do this. This is the check plots, okay, where I didn't. And and use the thatch away. Uh, by the way, we did some research uh, that I don't have time to tell you about, and I knew I wouldn't, um, that we found that um, when, we, when, we, when we groom, not this, but when we groom, we actually help stop footprinting on greens, but we'll save that for next time I come in. Um, for this, I just want you to notice, here's our check plot, and this is how much sand we picked up in the mower buckets the next day. And if I, if I broom and I go back and forth with a broom and try and broom in the sand, this, this is the amount of grams I picked up of sand the next day with the grass clippings. If I vibratory roll, I almost, I cut that in half basically, okay? Well, that means it's worth using a vibratory roll. Dr. Sirock and a friend of mine, it, University of Tennessee did the same study. This is done on bent grass. He did the same study on Bermuda grass and doing one vibratory roll after brooming, after brushing, uh, decreased the amount of sand picked up the next day by 83%. That's significant. I mean, that's, I mean, why not do it? Um, so here now, we now have like these vibratory, we have these brushes we can use out front of the the, the, the uh, roller to really help get it into place and uh, probably a great, great way to do that. Decrease dollar spot. And it almost doesn't matter if you get dollar spot or not. What I want you to know, can I have, can I have 10 more, nine to 10 more minutes, Eric, or no? Yes, yes, no problem. Dr. Tom, this is fantastic. No problem. Okay. None? Yes, please. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to, dollar spots are worst disease. We spend more money on dollar spot than any other, any other disease. I don't know what it is where you're at, but that's the number one disease. And it sounds like we have people from lots of different countries here, continents even. Um, so this is, so even if you don't have dollar spot, I'm going to show you why this is important. First of all, can you see a difference? Okay. Wow not rolled versus rolling. I mean, wow. Think about the possible economic savings with that, okay? Why is there less dollar spot? Well, I hired, I got a guy named Paul Giordano. Uh, he was the 
he, he, Dr. Joe Vargas was his, uh, I can't talk. Dr. Joe Vargas was his uh, uh, major professor and we set up a study for him. I set it up and for three years, we put no fungicides on these plots, okay? And I wanna show you the data because the data is what it's all about. This is back in 2008. And if you remember one thing from all today, well, remember the appropriate green speed, but this is awesome. Here's our check plot. Now the grass, at least as far as bent grasses go, if bent grass is new, it doesn't get much disease the first year, not at least dollar spot. So notice this is how much dollar spot we get in 2008. Not very much. What we did with this is all of these were mowed every day. Then we had plots we rolled in the morning. And then we had plots we rolled in the afternoon. And then we had plots we rolled two times a day. Now check this out. If I rolled in the morning or the afternoon, it didn't matter, okay? I mean, the, the mo rolling in the afternoon still got rid of the disease. If I look, if I go down to where I rolled twice a day, I mean, look at that. That's like 10 times less dollar spot, day, year one. Okay, now let's watch, let's go to 2009 and see how these numbers explode. The control plot has 35 lesions the first year. Let's go to 2009. Now it's up to 146. <laughs> Boom. Rolling in the afternoon or the evening makes no difference. And the reason that's big is a lot of people theorize that when you're rolling in the morning, you're really, you're moving dew and gutation water. But when we're rolling in the PM, that's not the case. So something else is going on. Oh, and rolling two times is just friggin' awesome. Now let's go to 2010. Okay, we had 146 lesions in the control. What happens in 2010? We double it. <laughs> but these didn't double. These didn't come close to doubling, okay? We were, these were in this, these were like 70, and it's picked up a handful more. Look at this. The two times hardly changed at all. This is the importance of a great rolling program, okay? Um, excellent. This is what rolling two times a day for three years looks like. This is what, this is what the control looks like. Isn't that awesome? Um, when I started telling people to roll plots, people would literally tell me there's no way they would ever roll. They would never have one of those machines on their golf course. People used to yell at me. People used to put their finger in my chest. Now I know more and more people rolling two times a day, um, basically because of the research we've come up with. And it's awesome. So why? This is important. Why less disease where we roll? The answer is right here. What I asked Paul to do was take some microbial counts. So this is his Petri dishes. Um, and the thought process, my theory was the, that we would change the microbial population in the soil by rolling. And sure enough, we did. If you see these, and it says bacteria, 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 uh, bacteria, 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 actinomycetes, bacteria, bacteria, actinomycetes, bacteria, all of these populations were increased with rolling. Bacteria is the smallest living thing on the planet. Oh, and by the way, fungus cause all of our diseases except bacterial wilt. All our other diseases are caused by fungus. Bacteria is the smallest little living thing. If we can increase the bacteria population, most bacteria, there's lots of bacteria that are beneficial to our plants. There's lots of, that even help them fix nitrogen. There's bacteria that are antagonistic to the fungi. And there's bacteria that just by sheer population, 
will be able to out eat and out compete the fungi that cause the disease. So it doesn't matter what disease we're talking about. It doesn't necessarily have to be dollar spot. Dr. Bruce Clark showed that if you have a good top dressing program, do that vibratory roll, brush it in, get that good top dressing program going, and you roll, you decrease another major disease uh, called uh, anthracnose, okay? And I'm sure as I'm sitting here in Michigan and you're on the other side of the planet, that if I come over to Sentosa and start a study for a year, we're gonna find out ways that we decrease diseases of warm season grasses too. Problem is no one's done it yet and I can't do it in Michigan. <laughs> the grass will die. <laughs> so now I'm telling you to roll two times a day. Am I out of my mind? Um, well, what is the point of diminishing returns for rolling? And the way I look at it is these plots were rolled for three months, one time, two time, four time, and eight time a day. Okay, and this is bent grass. Um, this shows you the increases in green speed from one to the other. And this shows you the decrease in dollar spot from one to the other. I mean, well, we don't even need to put down a chemical on this, but don't do that. The point of diminishing returns for cool season grasses really without wear is two times a day. And so what I tell people generally is for cool season grasses, roll a minimum of every other day and a maximum of two times a day. It might be more for that. So we've got agronomics, budget, customer satisfaction. We can put it all together. Which of these pots look better? The one on the left or the one on the right? Again, I had someone go out and walk on this and walk on this. This was mowed every day at the mowing height of 3.2 millimeters. This was alternated mowing at 3.2 millimeters one day and rolling the next. Big financial savings because nothing costs more than mowing. And by the way, you don't have to back lap your roller. You don't have to change bed knives on your roller. This shows if I mow and roll every day, this is for more cool season grasses, maybe you will you can experiment this with yourself. But if I mow and roll every day, I basically get the exact same green speed as if I roll daily and mow every other. That's taking away, if I roll more than I mow, mow roll every day and mow every other. If you did that in a warm season climate, you would do this and get success, because I've done it in Florida, warm place, during the coldest part of the year. Now, I know some of you are on the equator and there is no coldest part of the year, but it, it, it's cool. So agronomics, budgets, customer satisfaction, and that's one of the names, that's it's where we started. Customer satisfaction is the base. It's the reason that that we should want to get these green speeds we want, okay? It's the most important thing on the course. It's going to make our membership the happiest. One last time, I love this. This is mode 2.24 millimeters every day. This is mode at 3.9 millimeters, mowed and rolled every day. Obviously, this is standing up to the traffic a lot better than this is, but here's the surprise. This ended up 1.5 feet faster on a green speed measurement throughout the year. Point, speed doesn't kill, ignorance kills. I was just showing you the fastest plots I could create. I'm gonna go back here just for a second. The fastest plots had the least disease because I'm rolling them every day, okay? Speed does not kill. So let's make those members happy. Remember they say drive for show, putt for dough, right? <laughs> and if we're gonna putt for dough, we want them to be fast and firm. Let's make them happy. Superintendent sent me this one just this year. Thank you for the work you've done, Dr. Nikolai. It has been a great help to me at Meadowbrook Country Club 
and maintain a putty service the majority of my members rave about. Most complaints come about from one of my guys cutting a cup a little too adventurous. <laughs> yes, cup cutting is important if you have undulations. And the golfers hit it too hard. All the best. The point being, this is all yours that you can do. I've helped a lot of people through emails and stuff, and sometimes I've been going as a consultant. But this is something you can do, and uh, and I, I wish you all great success. Oh, I didn't know I ended this way. This was an old one. Read this sign. It's fun. <laughs> this is literally what we were doing after we released the stint meter in the 70s. This is what we said. Caution. Green speed kills. No, it doesn't. Ignorance kills. Lie, it's funny. No, it's not. It gets you fired. Get your members to lower their expectations. Why? They paid a lot of money. Give them, don't, let's exceed their expectations, okay? And the fact, the stint meter is a tool and it's made for you. Thanks for having me. Well, doctor, that was fantastic. I mean, now I can really understand why you have your title as the doctor of green speed. And it's really, even as a layman, uh, not a turf manager, we have most of everybody on this uh, webinar audience is turf managers, but we do also have a couple of general managers and I'm sure they got a lot from this presentation. It was very accessible and, and thanks for the, the passion and the great oh, graphics, thanks. fantastic. Um, I just a question on you on that perspective. Do you, do you have you ever, been invited to present to members and talk to members in any of your any of your roles it would be interesting because for them um, to i'm sorry Eric. At, um, um every time it's happened i can tell that they think they're gonna hate me um, um i've probably i'll make up a number 10 times in my life, I've had a superintendent call and it got to the point that I went to a green committee meeting yeah. and I'm going to give them, you know, a half hour presentation, kind of what I showed you condensed more built for them. And I can tell they know I'm going to tell them speed kills and lower your expectations. That's what they're expecting me to say. And I go in and I say, I show them this and I'm like, well, Jim can give you anything you want, but you got to give Jim a good cutting unit. You know what I mean? yeah. <laughs> I'm like, man, no, I can give you a 15, no problem. Um, and so then they end up really liking me. Yeah, I, gave, well, I gave a talk to the Golf Course Owners Association of Michigan hmm. and they just, because when you start talking about the fact that you can have this and save money. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I did that, that, that point, most of those were public courses, of course, and most of them didn't have rollers. And I'm pretty sure they all have rollers now. Because when you Fantastic. realize you're in place of a mall, it, it's, it all works. Well, I'm sure they'd be very welcome. I, we do have some questions, a uh, question from Anit in India. Um, what is your advice to a golf course superintendent maintaining two tiff dwarf greens, catering to average 250 rounds per day, uh, running full during the year, and in a city that goes from four seasons with a maximum temperature of 47 degrees and a minimum in winters to four degrees? This is centigrade. Um, he's asking what kind of speed is ideal for him or her to maintain for daily game barring tournaments? So um, I can't answer that. I think it's, it's, I would, I would try to, to either get your pulse, you know, try and figure out what green speed the major, the majority of the people come through. And I didn't mention this when we did the, I've done the Morris method survey to get the ideal green speed uh, quite a few times. And every court, I don't think any course I've ever done it at has done it the same. And when they did Mike's course the first time with the help of the pro and they handpicked 20 people that would take the survey. 
And so there was a woman involved. There was low handicapper, high handicapper. And that's how they came up with their range. So the easiest way to do it might be to do it like that. Um, I know other courses that just handed them out to everybody. And by the mm -hmm. way, they do that survey. I don't think I mentioned this. They don't know what the speed of the greens are. They just are asked what this, it's a blind survey when they do it. Um, but the easiest, the best answer I can give you besides I don't know, <laughs> that's the most honest, is, is if you could do a survey and you could even just hand out 10 responses. You know, if you took green speed measurements every day and, and, and had the pro shop at random hand out 20 surveys to people, you could come up with that Excel sheet that would get you what that after about two, three months, it would, it would get you where you, you'd want to be. So the, the Morris method, the five questions is a good starting point for any course to, uh, any especially course. a member's course to determine where the satisfaction should lie. And to be very truthful, um, I've probably, I, uh, if I've helped a hundred people, I'll just say, start the Morris method. 50 to 60% of the golf courses that started doing it after about a month, the members just said, you know what? We're good. Thanks for asking. <laughs> and like, and it so it didn't even go its course. However, the superintendent, every time that I know of, had enough data that they went, this is the number I'm going for. Because mm. really, it's if you have enough, if you have a number you're going for, that's when you can start getting all the agronomic and financial benefits out of this whole thing. Otherwise, so one, fine. at one point, the members acknowledge that you're there actually trying to uh, get their feedback, and then you still right, have right. that, that the, the knowledge is power, you still have the data behind it to continue with it. Right. We have a question from Ulan. Um, he says, what is your advice to our, to our greens, which have is 20 years old? We still try to get the same green speed per day, but we're afraid of the age of the greens will make the speed lower and destroy our greens. So the, the older grass, I guess, is the question in, in treating them. Well, this is where this is where I knew I'd get in trouble with agronomics on warm season grasses. Uh, no, I'm I am I'm I'm it's it's like it could snow out here today. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, um I, I'm, I, I'm really sorry. I don't have a great, I don't have an answer for you. I mean, I'd be reaching at straws. Um, my experience is I never worry about the age of a grain. I mean, I literally don't. Um, um, but I can't say that I know Bermuda grass or those greens well enough to know if I should worry or not. Sorry. It's a tough one. Uh, I'm not lying to you like my president would. So <laughs> there we go. Uh, we have a question from Nikhil in India. Um, how do you distinguish between subjective and objective opinions on green speeds? I guess, yeah. This is this question? Oh, um, well, that's where the sampling pool is probably a good. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't think you can divide them out. There's, there's, I mean, I think you're always. You're always going to have some people that are always just going to say you can't make it fast enough. I, I mean, that's what we'd call the vocal minority. Mm. There aren't many of them, but unfortunately, they might be on your greens committee. <laughs> um, that's where the importance of is of having a good sampling pool, um, um, because yes. Some people are just rude. Um, some people want to be dictators and realize doing the Morris method to do that survey is literally democracy. Um, it, it's saying, what do the majority of us like? And by the way, another thing, I mean, and really, I want you to, this is just honest. Everyone was going crazy at Mike's golf course when they did this method. Okay. The, the greens chair told Mike, he goes, I don't even want to go in the pro shop. 
I, I don't even want to go in the, in the clubhouse because everyone's complaining about green speed every day. And that's why they did this survey. And this survey works so well for them that the very first time the member guests came around, Mike went, which was always the, which was always the tournament you tried to jack up your green speeds, right? And he went in and he said, what do I do for the member guest to the green committee? And the green committee went, huh, that's a good question. Well, keep it as it is. I mean, so literally it just, it just got rid of every, all the garbage. Um, but I, I guess the best answer is, you know, I, you don't need to, you don't need to know the difference between a subjective and objective as much as you just need to have a nice, nice enough sampling pool to make it wash out. <laughs> That's the best answer I could give you. Thank you. What uh, I have a question you, yeah, so go ahead. go ahead. Sorry. My local golf course, uh, Big Ten golf course, Michigan State golf course, they got rid of the superintendent um, because his greens weren't fast enough about six weeks before they were going to hold the big 10 championship ladies tournament. And so the new, so the assistant came to me immediately and he said, what do I do? What do I do? I'd like to keep this job. And I know that how these greens perform during this championship are going to be big. And I said, Oh, this is easy. Um, uh, the female golf coach, his name was Stacy. And I said, tell Stacy, we'll do a survey with her players. Mm. Think about this. With mm. her players on their home course, so we can dial in the green speed they want over any, uh, I, I said, and that's what we'll give them for the tournament. So he went to Stacy and he told Stacy, we want to do this survey with your girls and we'll, we'll make this perfect for you. And her response was, and I'm gonna edit this a little, you can't effing make these things fast enough. <laughs> so I took that as a personal challenge and he came up to her during the tournament and he said she was crying and asked him to slow them down. <laughs> it was awesome. And, oh, and we didn't kill him to do it either. You know, it's, it's all okay. Someone had a question. I'm sorry. No, I just had a on on automated mow. Uh, you know, on mowing, the automation of mowing uh, going going forward. Will this have any impact for you? Uh, you know, as far as any of the practices you're talking about. Um, I haven't. I this is going back probably a decade, and there was an automated greens mower called the RG3. And certainly all the bugs weren't worked out of it yet. Um, I did a short study with them um, because I thought that the unit might be so heavy that it rolled and it both rolled and, and mowed and it might act like a roller and decrease disease and get the same green and, you know, but we did a, a short comparison with it and uh, it didn't. Um, I, I'm guessing automation will come and one day no one will have a job. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know where all this is going. There's more and more people and less and less jobs. And uh, um, it's sad, but uh, I suppose it's coming. I know in America, I mean, we uh, we have, you know, we have a lot of people that don't want to labor. And uh, um, so we have a work shortage and uh, it's, it's hard. Well, doctor, thank you once again for your time. It's been well received. We had a great audience and I know they got a lot out of it. And we, as I said before, we'd love to come have you out here when uh, travel is resumed and really appreciate your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, the day that someone some country out there allows an American to leave and go to it. I'm getting on a plane and come. Okay. All right. Or I'm going to drive to Canada, which is just, but you know, uh, 
we are rightfully quarantined from the world and I got nothing to do with it. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. I, I hope I was, I was your Oh, it was great. It was fantastic. I'm going to go through a few housekeeping issues with our attendees. You know, first of all, thanking everybody for taking time out of their busy schedule. And okay. every Thursday we do uh, our events. And so just to let you know, next Thursday, we have Andy Johnson, who uh, Dr. Tom mentioned, uh, talking with, of Sentosa, talking with uh, Jonathan Smith from the GEO and Anthony Scanlon from the International Bell Foundation on the United Nations uh, Sports for Climate Action Initiative, which Sentosa just joined. They're gonna go over what it means, uh, the criteria for it. And if your club in Asia would like to also try to qualify, uh, they'll go through those details at that time. So that's next Thursday, the 29th. Week after that, we'll have uh, Dr. Fred Yelverton from uh, North Carolina State talking about turf management, weed control, et cetera. And he'll be on November 5th. Uh, and then um, on our club management, we'll resume on November 12th to have Vijay Kumar Raj, he's CCM general manager of the Metro Metropolitan Club. And he'll talk about building membership and membership activity in a city club location. So a good variety of, uh, of speakers. So thanking the doctor once again, and uh, wishing him and all our, our participants a, a great rest of the day and a great weekend to come. Everybody stay safe. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.